Okay. Okay. Um, in, the, in the spirit of um, trying to amalgamate uh, these two these two panels, this is a slight reconfiguration of things I was going to say. Um, and just to revisit what we what we've been trying to do in the in sessions, I guess it's thinking through what a, a, a comparison might mean through particular registers, uh, and then alongside that, thinking about what kind of city future values are then thereby invoked. And I guess the moment we see the city as a market, then obviously it makes some things visible, it renders other things invisible, it, it actually valorizes some logics and it devalorizes others. I think this works uh, both performatively and analytically. When you see the city as an economy, uh, there are certain kinds of logics that become uh, made comprehensible, but also the, the, the actual act of seeing the city as an economy creates a form of disciplining of the city itself. And this kind of juxtaposition, I guess, is uh, one of the things I take as a, as a background to some of the things I want to say about, about my, migration. We know there are literatures on conventions, on, um, <coughs> on regimes in the city and so on, that uh, make clear what I take as self-evident or banal, that the, the market itself is always uh, contingent, it's path dependent, it's historically dependent, historically um, uh, set in a context where the balances between the borders of the social, the economic, the cultural, are always institutionally um, up for grabs, but also variable. That's less what I'm interested in, in that kind of literature, than actually thinking about the ways in which certain kinds of knowledge make visible their preferred cities. So I think um, in the context of the marketplace, we know that the architectural makes the city visible in one way, the planner makes the city visible in another, and the logic of economics, uh, likewise, a, a third, if you like. Now, what does that what does that mean? What I think is interesting partly about migration is not just what happens to people who travel and those uh, who live in the areas where they arrive. There are lots of things around that that I think are uh, of great value. But in a sense, when we're thinking about city futures, I think migration helps us unpick the DNA of the urban. It helps us unpick the DNA of the city because it, it disrupts. Uh, in part, and one, just one of the ways in which it does this, is it begins to confuse some of the ways that we think about the balance between what happens now and what happens longer term. You like the, the synchronic and the diachronic, the, the, the static um, and the dynamic elements of how we think about cities over longer periods of time or through, through a snapshot. Um, we know historically that uh, Aristotle claimed the Athenians always said we should leave the city uh, leave the city a better place than when you arrived, and uh, that's a kind of profoundly important ethical imperative. What that actually means for those people who have yet to arrive, who get to be born, who speaks for the constituency of the absent, um, actually begins to think about migration potentially as a configuration of the temporal alongside of the config configuration of the spatial how you think about the city that it emerges, the city that is the future, the future urban, is partly about how we think about the rights of the city of those who have arrived second, not those who have arrived first, frequently juxtaposing the interests of those who are very poor alongside those who are even poorer still who may yet uh, arrive subsequently. I think what this uh, what this might mean when we begin to think about the, the, the future city is that I want to talk a little bit about a notion of ambiguity. Um, and what I mean by ambiguity in the context of uh, migration is, is as follows. There's a, there's a scholar that many people in the room, we have uh, a kind of comparative basis of uh, scholarship and research projects funded by the Economic and Social Research Council from from China, from Brazil, from South Africa, from other parts of Europe. But in a kind of an area studies field, the work of Peter Ho is uh, well known for his uh, sense that he argues about the productive value of ambiguity. 
the way he tr the way he tries to make a case is that if you look at the, the kinds of development trajectory you might expect in various disciplines, development economics, but also in various other forms of uh, academic research that uh, addresses rapidly changing cities and rapidly developing cities, global south, global north. The argument would be that for successful development to occur, you need clarity of property rights in particular. The clarity in, in, in various forms, clarity alongside transparency. And what um, Peter Hove has argued is that actually maybe we should test this a little. Uh, in the context of China, he actually argues that if you look and through a lens, he works within the kind of domain of heterodox economics, but part of what he argues is that ambiguity can be productive, precisely because of the fact that what ambiguity can do is that it begins to trigger certain kinds of debate in specific settings. What ambiguity can do is it actually can produce a, a situation where if my rights are uncertain, but your rights are uncertain too, then we need to think about relationships that are not just about today, or not just about tomorrow, but are about the day after tomorrow, if you like. So they, they produce an ongoing debate that is infinite, rather than a contractual exchange which is finite. They actually reconfigure potentially a relationship <coughs> between the legal and the economic. And law and economics has a particular resonance in the ways in which we think about the economics of, of, of city governments, how we think about private interests and public goods and how they are juxtaposed one to the other. Now, for, for, for Peter Hope, part of what he argues initially in a rural setting, more recently in his work in, in an urban setting, is that these forms of um, ambiguity are partly uh, a product of... Um, what he describes as uh, endogenous accident rather than exogenous deliberation, which is, he's trying to kind of address in economics literature, but what he's talking about in a sense is the ways in which the path dependencies and historical specificities of urban development in China reveal both the strengths and the weaknesses of certain kinds of ethical and legal settle settlements in the, in, in the country. And I suppose his work makes me think differently, and I just want to illustrate very quickly by... Um, three very brief examples drawn from 25 years of research, in my case six years of research in another than five years of kind of occasional engagement, that some of the things that that might point to when we think about mi migration. Very quickly, very, very crudely, when you look at the settlement of Bangladeshis in the United Kingdom from the 1970s onwards, what you see is roughly along the, the following lines, that you get the usual pattern of people settle in one place, but they're pulled by markets. And we know in economics terms the externalities of migration, the unintended uh, costs of migration, actually flow at one geographical scale. The unintended benefits of migration flow at a different geographical scale. The benefits of migration are crude to the labor market that works across the city as a whole crudely. The uh, costs of migration frequently are focused on those areas where people try and find somewhere to live, where various other forms of disruption might occur. Crudely, what that means is that in the 60s and 70s, the Windrush generation, so much in the press right now, if you look at the diagnosis from various analytical studies over the last 50 years, there were always jobs, but the contest was frequently around housing, where people lived. What that meant for Bangladeshis in, in London was that people were excluded from the private market, excluded from the public market, and frequently moved into squatting. The squatting movement emerges as claims around ambiguous rights to have access to property are then asserted, formally eventually recognised through the creation of black and minority ethnic housing associations and subsequently create a juxtaposition both of new institutions, of separatists, what are condemned more recently as separatist institutions, asserting migrant rights in context, and subsequent concentration of British Bangladeshis in some of the worst social housing that in a part of London through a legislation of right to buy creates a buying out of a certain housing stock because it makes more sense to buy the worst house, the worst flat, the worst one bedroom apartment in inner London and then rent it out to the next generation of migrants than it does to actually try 
and enter the, the market privately another way because you subsidize the right to buy and then you move somewhere else and ironically 25, 30 years on you get a generation of landlords renting out some of the worst property in London to a subsequent generation of, of migrants. We've heard a couple of paid presentations about the Chongjinsu and the villages in, in Shenzhen and in a similar fashion in some ways what the, the villages in the city in, in Shenzhen do because of the configuration of rural property rights in the cities, alongside the, the hukou regime, which effectively limits citizenship rights of migrants in cities, it means that you get a massive concentration of urban migrants in these settlements that, that we've heard two presentations from colleagues earlier on to, today around, which actually warehouse migrants are run by public limited companies, frequently audited by PricewaterhouseCoopers and Deloitte's, uh, in the words of one uh, China scholar, they basically, the local villages cultivate real estate rather than cultivate crops because the villages in the city in somewhere like Shenzhen actually now become warehouses for the migrants but as the, as the economy moves upscale, the migrants are fairly ruthlessly displaced. It is functional in one sense and ruthlessly uh, economically uh, functional as, as people have moved out of the, that, what... Uh, Yaping Wang described earlier as the worship Wang, the handshake apartments, uh, as the worst of the housing gets uh, the, uh, moved, uh, torn down, as the demand for unskilled labor is displaced by the demand for skilled labor in Shenzhen, and you get private and higher quality apartments in line with a very demand responsive institutional structure of housing. But effectively, what you get as, as a result is, is a combination of a, a political settlement locally where city council planners negotiate with the people that run the villages in the city in a dialogue about what is legal, what is not, what is needed, what is not. It is not straightforward state provision, it's not straightforward public provision. It is actually a kind of a mediated outcome of what the city, the city needs. For better and for worse. I don't want to be uh, naive about this, right? And these are also conditions of intense exploitation in many cases. But the actual the, the provocation of debate, the provocation that arises through the ambiguity around property rights, is precisely what generates a, a surfacing of what is up for grabs. And the final point I'll make we move on to just to conclude is that I mean similarly when I've spent a number of years in recent times attending conferences, talking to colleagues, working, listening to some of the development lobby around some of the things we heard and Christoph uh, it was talking from Habitat, I think it's interesting in this regard, thinking about some of the rhetorics of titling, of titling, of security, of tenure, of actually trying to recognize the formal rights of informally settled people for all sorts of very positive reasons. One of the th things that raises challenges for organizations like Slum Dwellers International and others is what does it mean to think about those rights and those assertions of the local in the context of those who, again, have yet to arrive. How do we make visible, not necessarily an ethical competition between effectively a divide and rule of the, of the poorest, but a sense in which the ethical dilemmas of, of rationing of public goods and the definition of private interests is settled through a deliberative process. So what this means, just to close, is that I think an analytically, that sense of a notion that recognizes the ambiguities of the relationships between law and economics in the formation of markets actually might straightforwardly highlight the path dependencies of why it is that Shenzhen, London, Joburg, some of the cities we've heard about the last couple of days, resolve these things in different ways. Migration is almost like the, you stick the, the uh, the stick in the wheel, and it should, this, the way the wheel comes off begins to highlight what works and what doesn't work about, about those kinds of processes. But also, I think conceptually what it does is that it actually begins to make visible certain specific, <coughs> particular market logics alongside conten contingent interests. And I suppose the point I'd wanted to, to make to conclude is that I think that, that, that is important, that notion of ambiguity triggering debate is important precisely because it makes it visible alternative futures. 
it actually undermines simple claims frequently made by well-meaning people in the name of the poorest from positions of privilege, precisely because some of the ethical dilemmas in terms of urban settlement actually begin to come through from the challenges of combining the logics of social distribution, economic growth. They are in some ways actually made visible <coughs> when we make clear what is happening when we think about the rationing of public goods and the pricing of pub private goods in the specific interests of migration settlement in the markets of cities globally, north and south. And I think it's in that spirit of ambiguity that the making visible of those ethical dilemmas begins to open up, potentially, a conversation about the settlement of the future city.